the paradigm of the, the Christian scriptures is one of theology, i.e. what we believe about God, and one of ontology, about how we fashion and construct and make our own being as Christians. So it's in that light that I'm going to proceed to talk about some contradictions in the Bible that are popular amongst Muslims. Ready when you are? So, um, guys, I want to talk about apologetics and I want to talk about the nature of apologetics. Because lots of Christians do apologetics, but I don't think we actually understand what apologetics is. The holy apostles command us to be able to give an answer for the hope that we have. However, we mustn't confuse giving an answer for the hope that we have with the idea of defining doctrine. Defining doctrine is not the same as defending doctrine. Defending doctrine is merely showing that the doctrines that we hold are not maybe contradictory or don't contradict history or don't contradict science, so on and so forth. It's about reconciling our beliefs to themselves, to the world around us. It's not about inventing new beliefs nor is, it about, nor is it about defining, necessarily, what those beliefs are. And one of the, the, the key issues that is, is brought up is this idea of contradictions in the Scripture. And this idea that the Scripture is perfect. And, and I've been lampooned for saying on camera that I don't believe the Scriptures are perfect. So let me explain what I mean by that. What, what, I, what I mean by this is that the scriptures are perfect in so far as they claim perfection. And in 2 Timothy um, 15, we'll pull it up. Yeah, sure. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So all scripture is God breathed is what the scriptures teach. Now, when Paul wrote that letter, he was talking about the Old Testament. The Gospels had not been written at the time that he had written this letter. Not even Mark had been written at the time that he wrote this letter. And he says that Scripture is good for, read again. <coughs> scripture is good for teaching. Teaching. For, for reproof. Reproof. For correction. Correction. For training in righteousness. For training in righteousness. So the scriptures are to teach us how to be good souls. And the scriptures don't stand alone, they stand with the church. The church wrote the scriptures, the church wrote the scriptures to Christians, the church wrote the scriptures about Christian things. So it was written by Christians, for Christians, to Christians, about stuff to do with Christianity. All of Paul's letters were reactionary letters, with the exception of the Epistle of Rome. So the scriptures and Christians don't believe that the scriptures are perfectly preserved, like Muslims do. That's a Muslim belief, not a Christian belief. Christians don't believe that the scriptures are a scientific textbook and can never contradict science. That's an Islamic belief, not a Christian belief. The paradigm of the, the Christian scriptures is one of theology, i.e. what we believe about God, and one of ontology, about how we fashion and construct and make our own being as Christians. So it's in that light that I'm going to proceed to talk about some contradictions in the Bible that are popular amongst Muslims. Okay. And I want to point out that Muslims have all the same problems in their book, but with an additional problem. The Quran says about itself that it is perfect. And it says that if it was from any other than Allah, I would find contradictions in the Quran. And we do find many contradictions in the Quran. But what we're going to talk about are the contradictions that are popular amongst Muslims in the Bible. So, have you found the first? So, if you could find the first one for us, yeah. So, the first one is Second Samuel twenty-four one. 
Now again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and it incited David against them to say, go, number Israel and Judah. So the, the verse that we've just read says that the anger of the Lord incited David to number Israel. So we heard everyone. Have you found it? Yes. Now read the second one. Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So here we've got one in Chronicles saying that it was Satan that moved David to number Israel. So one is saying the Lord and the other one is saying Satan. How do we reconcile this? Well, we've got to understand something. That God is the ultimate cause of all things. One of them is explaining the theological underpinnings of every activity. That God allowed Satan to move Israel to number. Sorry, move David to number Israel. So one is speaking from the ultimate cause. God has granted permission in his wider will. And one is talking about the specific cause or what Aristotle would call the material cause. I.e. Satan, by the permission of God, stood against Israel. Uh, sorry, stood against David and caused him to number Israel. But the reality is, there's another way we can understand this passage. The word Satan simply means adversary. So it could be that an adversary to David caused him to number Israel, to see how many fighting men he has to fight against this adversary. And so we see that there's no contradiction here. One is saying that God causes all things, that God caused David to number Israel. And the other one talks about how God caused David to number Israel through Satan. We know in the, the, the parable of Job that God is the one that removes his hand of protection to allow the devil to do things. And so we see that in Job chapter 1 verse 2. We don't need to go to it. Now, the next one that we're going to go to is in the same chapter, 2 Samuels. We'll just, are you in Chronicles? Same Chronicles. Okay, yeah. 21, read verse 5. Now what? Yep. Yep. Are you ready? Let me just finish the point. Now, I, I want to draw out something that's really important here. Okay. That when you're giving apologetics, it is completely acceptable to have different apologetics to the same issue. It, there's more than one reconciliation to many problems in the scripture. And the point of apologetics is only to show that an apparent problem can be reconciled. There's no issue using the word problem. Crosswords have problems that you solve. Just because a crossword has a problem doesn't mean you can't solve it. And there are sometimes many solutions to the same problem. So let's look at another one. 1 Chronicles 21.5 Job gave the number of the census of all the people to David. And all Israel were 1,100,000 men who draw the sword. And Judah was 4,700,000 men who drew the sword. So, in 1 Chronicles, it says all the fighting men were 1,100,000. Now, read 2 Samuel 24, 9. And Job gave the number of the registration of the people to the king. And they were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. Now, did you pay attention carefully? One of them said, all the people. One chronicle said, all the people. And my Jewish brother is nodding his head in agreement because he knows the same thing that I do. But the one in 2 Samuel 24, 9 said the valiant men. So it's making a distinction between all the people in Samuel, in all the people in Israel and the valiant warriors in Israel. So the categories that it is numbering are different. And therefore, the numbers that are given are different. So, uh, an apparent contradiction. I've got my Jewish brother giving me a round of applause back there. Oh now, do it on camera. <laughs> Thank you. So, the reality is that this beloved contradiction of the Dawah team is no contradiction at all. They've got nothing. So, let's read another one. 2 Samuel 24, 13. 
So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Loud and clear. <coughs> Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days persist... Persist... I can't be asked that. Pestilence in your land. Pestilence. Pestilence in your land. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Now, in 1 Chronicles 21.12 it states... Either three years of famine, or three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even persistence, pestilence, pestilence, pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Right, you've learned a new word today, pestilence. pestilence yeah, so, I remember that one. what we have is one part of the Bible that says seven years of famine, okay. and another part of the Bible that says three years of famine. Ah, now, off. this sounds like a contradiction. But there are multiple ways that this contradiction can be reconciled. Okay. The first and the easiest for us Christians yeah. is just to look at the Septuagint. Because the Septuagint has a textual variant to the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text contains the contradiction in the Hebrew. But the Septuagint in 2 Samuel 24, 13 also says three years. And the Septuagint is older than the Masoretic text. It is a BC manuscript before Christ. Whereas the Masoretic text is an Anno Domini manuscript after the resurrection of our Lord. And so for us as Christians who prize the Septuagint, there's no contradiction here. But even the Hebrew Masoretic can be reconciled. And that is that in one of those passages, the writer is focusing in when the famine was at its harshest. The three years in the middle of the famine. Because you have years going into the famine, and then you have years coming out of the famine. It gets worse, and then it hits rock bottom, and then it gets better. And so one writer is focusing in on the harshest three years of the famine, Whereas the other writer is including the years where the famine gets worse and gets better. Both of these statements can be true. They are not necessarily contradictions. The third one, and a third way that you can reconcile this, and this is my least favorite, because I think, think it works least well with the text, is the idea that the prophet came to David twice, gave him one option, went away for him to pray about it, he prayed about it, and then when he came back he gave him a second option based upon the fact that he had prayed to God. Now I personally don't like that answer, but the reason why I'm drawing out all three answers is to show us as Christians that apolog the point of apologetics is to reconcile that which apparently seems irreconcilable. Uh, if you could start finding um, this passage here, 13, 12, 2 John? in John. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's the point of apologetics. The point of apologetics is not to invent doctrine. The point of apologetics is to show that that which appears like a contradiction at face level, at prima facie level, isn't a contradiction when you think about it. And Muslims love to point out contradictions in the Bible, but they get all het up and upset when we point out contradictions in their Quran. And then they appeal to literary devices like I have in The Last Contradiction. But I appeal to a literary device to reconcile that contradiction. So understand that there is such a thing as literary devices. Now, last week, in a debate that JC lost, we debated about the day that our Lord was crucified on. And I want to talk about that. Because I erroneously suggested that our Lord was crucified on the day before the Passover. Because I simplistically read John. Well, now I'm going to show you how John shows that Christ was crucified on the Passover and agrees with the Synoptic Gospels. 
because there is an apparent contradiction that John sees that Christ was crucified before the Passover and that the synoptics say Christ was crucified after the Passover. And I'm going to show that John agrees with the synoptics. I'm also going to show, ladies and gentlemen, why you need to study the idea of literary devices. Now first let me give an answer to this apparent contradiction favoured by some Christians that I don't agree with that would reconcile the contradiction before it even gets started. And their argument is simple. John is making a theological point, he is not making a historical point. So John shifts the Passover sacrifice to the day before, to the day of preparation, because he is making a theological statement about the importance of the crucifixion. Now I don't like that answer, but that is one way you can try to reconcile it through the genre of the literature that we're dealing with. But I'm going to show you from the text that the Gospel of John agrees with the synoptic Gospels that Christ was crucified after the Passover meal. So, if we read 13.2. <coughs> During supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Now, the scriptures, John has just said that during the supper, which supper is he talking about? Read verse 1. <coughs> now, before the feast of the Passover. Before which feast? Passover. Before the feast of the Passover. Keep reading. Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, uh, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So, ladies and gentlemen, everybody knows that the chapters that were put into the Bible were put into the Bible in the 1500s, 1600s. The earliest manuscripts didn't have chapters. John, in verse 1, is essentially putting a literary full stop before beginning a new thought about Jesus. He's saying that from the time of his coming to the present time, Jesus had loved his disciples. But at the supper, what supper? The supper of the Passover. He references the supper in verse 1. So that's the last supper. It is the birth point of the new covenant. Christ had loved them up to this culminating moment. The Pascha, that term Pascha, refers to the idea of the Pascha week. It is a festival that goes on for a week. It's not one night. Now the Passover, the what? The Passover. Loud and clear. <clears throat> the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. The Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. John is using the Passover to refer to the entire festival, not the one night. Now the Passover of the Jews was near. John is again using the Passover to refer to the entire festival, not the one night. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So the Passover is again referring to the entire festival, not the one night. I've shown you three times where John refers to the Passover as a week-long festival, not the single night. Now, John 13, 29. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something for the poor. Now, so, in John 13, 29, it says that, it says that Judas, with the money box, goes out to buy things for the feast or to give alms to the poor. It's important to understand that giving alms to the poor was not something that you would do on any random night. It would be something that you do on the Passover. And in other texts of ancient antiquity, it talks about alms being given in Jerusalem at the gates of the city. 
and at the gates of the temple at the time of Passover. But the term feast used in John 13, 29 is comparable to the same word in Luke 2, 41, which reads, Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. The word translated their festival is the same word translated in John for the feast. It's a generic term, not specific to the cedar meal. The Mishnah, Pesachim 10.1, and Josephus in his book Antiquities 18.2.2 shows the alms were given during the night of the Passover. So when in the Gospel of John, it says some assume that Judas was going out to give alms to the poor, that tells us that it was Passover night, not the day before Passover, not the day of preparation. So, in uh, Leviticus 15, 5 to 11, <clears throat> anyone who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until the evening. All who sit on, en on anything on which the one who has the discharge has sat shall wash their clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until the evening. All who touch the body of the one with the discharge shall wash their clothes and bathe in water and be clean until the If the one with the discharge sits on persons who are clean, then they shall wash their clothes and bathe in water and be clean until the evening. Again and again, in Leviticus 15, 5 to 11, it says that they will be unclean again and again until the evening, until the evening, until the evening, it says. Now in John 18, 28, he reads, Then they took Jesus from, the, from Cal Cal Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. Early in the morning! They themselves did not enter the headquarters as to avoid ritual defilement. Uh, to avoid ritual defilement. And Remember what it says in Leviticus, that they will be unclean until the evening. Now, if this was the day of preparation and it was early in the morning, these Jews had nothing to fear about being ritually unclean for the cedar meal which happens in the evening. Why? Because your uncleansliness stops in the evening. You become ritually clean again in the evening. So why were they afraid? Because the Passover had already started and because if they had become ritually unclean, they would not be able to participate in that day's sacrifices, because sacrifices in the temple happened every day of Passover, in the afternoon, ready for the night before, ready for the following evening. No. So they were not worried about the cedar meal, they were worried about other meals and practices that day. Remember, these were the priests, the ones who performed the sacrifices in the temple. These sacrifices, ladies and gentlemen, went on for the entire week. And we're gonna see that in Numbers 28, 16 to 17. <clears throat> on the 14th day of the first month, there shall be a Passover offering to the Lord. That is the, sacri the Passover sacrifice. And on the 15th day of this month is a festival. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. Seven days is the festival of Passover. And there were sacrifices in the temple all of those seven days. Now, ladies and gentlemen, historians record that the Passover feast was a huge feast in the people of, for the people of Israel. Thousands of people would come. And it is recorded in the histories that these feasts would be a time of gathering, that 10 people would eat at one table the sacrifice that they had paid for in the temple. Thousands of people would descend upon Israel at the time of the Passover. So that's thousands of sacrifices that had to be made 
at the time of the Passover. It wasn't something that disappeared over in an hour. It wasn't done in two hours. The sacrifices, once they begun, would go on into the night. So, let us read on. So let me demonstrate that the sacrifices continued into the night because the whole of Israel was celebrating the Passover. <clears throat> when the service had been prepared for the priests stood at their place and the Levites in their divisions according to the king's command, they slaughtered the Passover lamb. Slaughtered the Passover lamb, carry on reading. And the priests dashed the blood that they had received from them while the Levites did the skinning. They set aside the burnt offerings so that they might dispute them according Distribute the, them. Distribute them according Don't to the Don't panic, group. just take your time. Read it loud and clear, that's all. Grouping to the astral houses of the people to offer to the Lord, as it is written in the book of Moses. And they did the same with the bulls. They roasted the Passover lamb with fire according to the ordinance. And they boiled the holy offerings in pots, in cauldrons and in pans, and carried them quickly to all the people. Afterwards they made preparations for themselves and for the priests, because the priests, the descendants of Aaron, were occupied in offerings, offering the burnt offerings and the fat parts until night. Until night! So the priests were occupied doing their duties until the night hour. Meaning that they would not have eaten their Passover supper because at night they arrested and betrayed Jesus. So they fulfilled their obligations in the temple and then they went to arrest our Lord and to try him through the night and then to take him to Pontius Pilate early in the morning. That is why they had not eaten the Passover supper. They had delayed it to do what they were doing. They tried Christ during the night and then they had not eaten the Passover and wanted to remain ritually pure to do so. What I am demonstrating, ladies and gentlemen, is that the apparent prima facie contradiction between John and the Synoptic Gospels is no contradiction at all, if you read the text carefully. Now it was on the day of preparation for the Passover and it was about noon. He cried to the Jews, here is your king. So, the verse has just said the day of preparation. But Christ was crucified on a Friday, which means what day comes next? The Sabbath. And every Friday is a day of preparation for the Sabbath. In 1914, in the Gospel of John, the word preparation is the word parescu. The word parescu is used also in Matthew 27, 62. Yep. <clears throat> the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gather before Pilate. The next day, the day of preparation, that the Jews gathered before Pilate in the Gospel of Matthew. And the synoptics are clear, Christ was crucified after the Passover. Which means that the word preparation is referring to the preparation for the Sabbath. We see exactly the same in Mark 15, 42. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. That is the same word of preparation that is used in the Gospel of John. So John is referring to the day of preparation, the high Sabbath that occurred during the Passover festival. So it isn't a contradiction at all. And we see it also in Luke 23, 54, you don't need to go there. It says exactly the same. So, ladies and gentlemen, we also see in the Didache 
The word Pariskyu refers to the day of preparation before the Sabbath. And Polycarp uses the same word to refer to the day of preparation before the Sabbath. So John was using that word as the day of preparation before the Sabbath in 1914. Furthermore, John 19.31. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. During what? The Sabbath. During what? The Sabbath. The day of preparation. They didn't want Jesus' body on the cross during the Sabbath. For the Jews, the Sabbath begins on Friday evening, which means that we are talking about the day of preparation on the Friday, the day before the Sabbath. That is in the Gospel of John. And just to settle this completely and to put this issue to bed once and for all, after these things, Joseph of Aram Amathea, who was a disciple of Jesus through a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. They took away the body on the Friday. And because the Sabbath was coming, they put him in the nearest tomb. So, there is no prima facie contradiction. There is no contradiction between the Gospel of John and the Synoptic Gospels. Furthermore, in the Gospel of John. So just so you know, guys, the Bible that I use every Sunday was nicked this week. It was nicked this week. So, I know I'm not going to say where, but it was nicked this week. So that means that I've got to relearn for my eyes where the passages are. Right, but in John 18, 38 to 39, listen to Pontius Pilate's words. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and said and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Which means that Jesus was crucified at the Passover. The contradictions that people present in the Bible are called prima facie contradictions. Prima facie means at face value. But with more study, you can demonstrate these contradictions do not exist. The Muslims have nothing. <laughs> they have nothing against the Bible. But now we can judge the contradictions in the Quran. And when we find contradictions in the Quran, we find evidence that even the Quran says, proves that the Quran is not from Allah. Any questions? Yes. So the question is, does the Bible confirm the existence of Israel 2,000 years ago? I'm shocked and amazed of the level of education that stimulates that kind of question. Even a very basic, quick research would demonstrate that Israel existed 2,000 years ago. And it's shocking that the level of education we have in the West, that we in the West are so disconnected from history that such questions are being asked. Any other questions on topic? Any questions? Do you think that Christians are financing their enemies by the way they shop and spend their money? What was that question? The question wasn't on topic. No, you said any questions. So I just... Okay, I'm going to answer this question. 
But then I'm asking people to ask questions on the topic. Okay. So, are Christians funding their enemies by the way they shop? The answer is yes. I encourage Christians to boycott halal meat. I encourage Christians to shop wherever they can at stores and businesses they know are owned by Christians. Any questions on the topic? On the topic. Okay, now any questions? How do you reconcile the we need a new Go on, one sorry. How do you reconcile the apparent contradiction um, uh, to do with the chariots, the number of chariots in the Old Testament? I would have to look at it, bro. I, I can't do it off the top of my head. You have to give me the verses. I have to look right. at it. Right. Any question on topic? Yeah, do you think we need we need an alternative um, an alternative economy? So Christians spend their money more with Christians and the money goes back into finance. How many Christians there are in this country and money is not going back into... So, so the question is essentially a repeat of the previous question and invites me to give the same answer. So I will just elaborate the answer that I've given. Christians need to support other Christians with their money. Wherever you can shop and work with Christians. Yeah. However, yeah. this is very hard to do without the Benedict option. The Benedict option requires Christians to consolidate their communities geographically, to move into the same geographical space, to live literally as neighbors to one another, because then, and only then, will you be able to know which businesses to support. In the absence of this, I encourage those who own Christian businesses to re-employ the use of the ictus symbol, the symbol of the fish. Have it as part of your logo, have it in your shop windows so that those of us who are Christians know that you are a Christian and so we can spend our money amongst our own people, the church, and so that we can support the idea of a Christian economy. When you spend money in Starbucks, that supports the LBGTQ XYZ <laughs> multicolored agenda, you are funding organizations that are opposed to the Christian faith. Yeah. When you buy halal meat, yeah. you're buying meat sacrificed to a false god. Yeah. You're funding dawah. Yeah. So spend your money in Christian organizations and to do this we need to consolidate geographically all of the arguments for the benediction the benedict option are insurmountable they demonstrate how as christians we can live fully christian lives so the brother is right we need an alternative economy and we christians need to start using our brains on how to create that Christian economy and the simplest and the best way is to take over geographical space. Any other questions? Any other questions on the topic? Can I get a bottle of water? Yes. Any other questions going once? So, sorry, emphasize on the Christian economy. So I'll go over the Christian economy again. Where you spend your money is an act of worship as Christians. The things you spend your money on talk about your values. JC, can I get a bottle of water? Okay. Where you spend your money 
says what your values are. They say the things that are important to you. If you spend your money on drugs, alcohol, is it an empty one? Is it a new one? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Where you spend your money, thank you, says what your values are, the things that are important to you. If you spend your money on designer labels or spend your money on wine and drink or on drugs, as some Christians do, that is an act of false worship. The things you spend your money on say what kind of things you support, what kind of things you're willing to back up with your cash. So it is an injunction upon the Christian to spend their money on things that are godly. Let me give you some examples. Don't buy designer labels. Don't buy new clothes. Buy clothes from charity shops that support Christian causes. Buy clothes that are plain and simple. Or buy clothes that have Christian messages. Buy clothes that are modest and not immodest. That demonstrate your modesty, not make a show and dance of either your wealth or of your body. Make choices that are Christian in how you spend your money. Don't buy meat during Lent. Don't buy meat during Advent. When we become an observable consumer, the economy will bend itself around us. When the economy recognizes that there are millions of people not interested in immodest clothing or not interested in designer labels but want good, durable, modest, plain clothing, they will sell to that market. If cafes realize that Christians fast during Advent and Lent and abstain from milk and dairy and meat and essentially eat vegetables and go vegan for the days of Advent and Lent, they will put on a menu to cater for Christians. So use your money to influence society. Boycott as much as you can those businesses that support the LGBTQ agenda and support businesses that are proud, proud to support freedom of speech, the Christian understanding of the family. Use your money to make an impact. Cancel your TV licenses. Starve the Guardian and the BBC of cash. And when you do it, do it and let them know that you're doing it because you're sick of their blasphemy and double standards. Use your money because the way you use your money is an act of worship to God. And we are called to be living sacrifices to God. Any other questions? Are you calling for total abstinence among Christians? I'll, he spoke first. Let me uh, take his question, then yours. Thank you very much. I've heard you on YouTube speaking about the Quran alone Muslims. Yeah. I'd like to know your, I'm a Quran alone Muslim, and I'd like to know your thoughts are on, on, on people that reject the Hadith because of the point. I will do. Good question. So, the question is about Quran only Muslims. Now, we in the West because of the manipulation and the lies of the BBC and the Guardian have this perception that Muslims are unified and that Christians are divided. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. Muslims are every bit as divided as Christians. They argue every bit as much as Christians. And there is a sect that you will find here today called Quran only Muslims. And the reason why these Quranists exist is because of an argument that I'm convinced of, that the Quran does not teach or permit the use of hadiths. Hadiths are a secondary source of literature that Muslims use to interpret their Quran. And Muslims themselves have absolutely no agreement about which hadiths to use. You often hear Muslims say, oh, you Christians, you have so many Bibles. How can we trust your Bible? You have so many. Well, by the same logic, how can we trust your hadiths when you have so many? and you don't agree about which hadiths are trustworthy. Furthermore, we Christians go around the park challenging Muslims about hadiths that they claim are reliable. Sahih. Sahih hadiths from Bukhari, from Muslim. And these hadiths the Muslims find embarrassing. And invariably, what they do is they chuck these hadiths under the bus. Let me give some examples. There's a hadith that says Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old child. That he married a girl when she was six years old. There is a hadith calling upon Muslims to drink camel piss. There is a hadith calling on Muslims saying, saying, saying that water is not made impure by anything. Not rotting carcasses, not menstrual towels, not piss, not Nothing. These are hadiths that Muslims find embarrassing. And when we confront Muslims with these hadiths, they chuck them under the bus. Now I'm taking questions. I said he would have a question. No, let me let him ask a question. No, let him ask a question. It's fine, we're, we're doing questions. Um, so you have mentioned, uh, you said that you don't want Christians to buy alcohol. You don't want them to consume it. Are you calling for the like, total abstinence? No. What I said was that where as a Christian you spend your money is an act of worship to God. It makes a statement about the things that you value. Now as Christians, we can drink alcohol, but it says in scripture that you should not, that you should not become drunk or drunkards, that you should be sober minded. We live in this society. One second, no, I'm dealing with his question. We live in this society in an entertainment culture. We value entertainment or at least the pagans of England do but as Christians we do not value entertainment above holiness and so your decisions about buying your clothes or about buying alcohol are determined by the value you put on holiness not the value you put on entertainment. Which is why, if you are spending more on entertainment, 
than you are in good works and charity and in developing your own knowledge of the faith. You are not using your money to worship God. You are using money to worship yourself. He's gone. He's gone. Okay. Questions. So you mentioned earlier, I told you I don't believe in hadith. You mentioned the hadith teach you to drink piss and to eat or to drink camel urine. And is that true? It is 100% true. Say that to everyone here. It's 100% true. I've read the hadith and it's all part of the reason is that I don't believe in hadith. All the hadith. However, all however, the... This is the question. However, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 27, and Proverbs, um, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 12, speak about eating shit and drinking piss. Is that true? Let's, is that true? let's look that at those verses. Right, let's okay. look at those verses. All right, so Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 12. One second, let me get my Bible. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. Second Kings chapter 18. Let's deal with the Ezekiel one. I, Second Kings chapter 18 verse 27. But Rabbi Shekhar said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent to me to men which sit on the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Right. Okay, wait, Bible, brother, it's all right. Bible, Right, so let's let's deal with this. Are you gonna right? Okay, let's get the passage, please. Ezekiel chapter four, verse twelve. Ezekiel chapter four, verse twelve. Verse twelve. Verse 12. Right now, now listen to the answer. Listen to the answer. So the brother admitted and agrees that there are hadiths that say that Muslims should drink camel piss as a cure to stomachache. And he agreed that there's a hadith that says the water, brother, if you're going to listen to the answer, don't, you want to debate them, go over there. So, in the hadiths, he said that there is a hadith that said water is not made impure by anything. Rotting carcasses, menstrual towels, poo, water is always pure according to Muhammad. So I was not lying about the hadith, and he agrees with me. Okay. Now let's look at his verses. Okay, Here God is speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. Okay. And I want you to hear, yeah. tell me if you hear, yeah. that God is commanding every Jew and every Christian to eat poo. If you hear that command, that every Jew and every Christian should eat and drink camel uh, piss and poo. Read it, verse 12. Read it, Bob, loud. God is speaking to the prophet Ezekiel, one man. And you take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them on one vessel and make bread for yourself during the number of the days that you lie on your side, 390 days. So that's a set limit of time. One person for one set period of time. Not every person for all time. Read on. You shall eat it. The food that you eat shall be 20 shekels a day of weight. At fixed times you shall eat it and you shall drink water by measure, one-sixth of a hin. At fixed times you shall drink. Notice the symbolism of all of these actions. Certain amounts, at certain times. You shall eat as barley cake, baking it in their sight on human dung. So the prophet is commanded to bake over his food over human dung in the sight of Israel for a certain amount of time. Why? Because it is a prophetic act. Ezekiel, one second, Ezekiel is in our language, in our modern culture, behaving like a shock jockey. It's like someone who protests in a church and strips themselves naked with Bible verses written all over them. It is a deliberately shocking action to provoke the people to think 
to listen. People do it today. The Lord commanded them do it in the past. But is that comparable to the hadiths that say that say that Muslims today should drink camel piss? One second, let me finish this one. You can still buy camel piss in Oman in the supermarkets. And Saudi Arabia, they sell it. Mohammed said in another hadith that if a fly lands in your drink, don't pour it out or get a new one. Dunk in and shake it around. Because Mohammed said the disease is under one wing and the cure is under the other wing. That's weird. No aid agency working in any disaster area today recommends the same. They associate flies with pestilence. But that's their hadiths. Is that the same as what I read in Ezekiel? No. No. The hadiths are used by Muslims today. We have it on camera, on Soko films. A Muslim saying he'll drink camel piss. A Muslim saying that he would drink the sweat of his prophet. It's a cult that was made by a medieval man that didn't know facts. And Muslims are grasping at straws to make false comparisons. Now, do you, do you want to go to Proverbs as well? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. But you, you do agree. No, we're not doing like, debates. We're doing no, questions. Like, what's the question? No, but it wasn't like, it says what's, camel dung. What's, yes, it said human dung, actually. Human dung, sorry. Can I ask my question? Yeah, actually, yes, yes, of course. Yep. And then putting context on the passages out of the Bible that you're you're giving a very un, unbalanced view. And that surely, in my opinion, and this is my opinion only, if we all believe in one God, yeah, surely we should be looking for the common ground rather than being divisive, which oh, is what you're okay. doing. Okay. So let me let me address this question. Because this is a question that is is abroad in our culture. The idea that we all worship the one God. I want to say to you that any Christian who says that we worship the same God as Muslims or Sikhs or Hindus or, or pagans doesn't know their Bible. Does not know their Bible. The scriptures actually teach that there is only one way to salvation. That no other name is given under heaven by which man can be saved. Now notice she walks off before she even hears the answer. Because this is the, this is the mindset of the progressive politically correct. They want you to accept a lie that we all believe in the same God but they can't back it up. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Loud and clear. All right. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 4. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Read on. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Read on. Or what harmony has Christ with Baal? Baal. I can't pronounce Baal. Baal. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Do not be unevenly yoked with the unbeliever. Those... Those that deny the Trinity are not Christians. Muslims deny the Trinity. So we cannot worship their God because their God is not our God. The Bible teaches Christ was crucified. The Quran teaches Christ was not crucified. The Bible teaches Christ was risen from the dead. The Quran says Christ was not risen from the dead. The Bible teaches that Christ is God the Quran teaches Christ was not God. How are these two religions the same? This lady has been lied to and she is a sheeple of the political class. She believes what our culture tells them in the absence and in the contradiction to the whole of the evidence. We Christians 
worship the God of Israel, Yahweh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Muslims worship the God of a 7th century demon-possessed Bedouin, cave-robbing, rapist, pedophile. These gods are not the same. Those that say we should find the common ground are saying so because the political elites are pushing a heresy. They are pushing a lie. And we Christians are called to be faithful to what the Bible teaches, not what our politicians tell us, not what our sellout bishops tell us, but the prophetic and the apostolic teaching which demonstrate that the God of Islam and the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are two different gods. I call you, sister, to repent of your unbelief because you have replaced the apostolic teaching with the politics of the world. And I'll debate it with you after this if you want to. Would you like to debate it, sister, right now? He, she won't. And I'll tell you why she won't. Because she teaches a heresy for political reasons and can't back it up from the Bible. And it's the same with every other Christian who teaches this grievous error. Any other questions on any topic? Do Christians worship the same God as Jewish people? Yes. The answer to this question is yes. However, let me qualify my yes. If there was an arboriculturalist here with me today, an arboriculturalist is someone who works on trees. They study trees. They know everything there is to do tree work. It's a science to them. And an arboriculturalist was stood next to me and someone asked us to describe the tree behind us. I would be able to give a description it's made of wood, it's green, it's brown, it's tall, it's got roots, it's got branches, it's got seeds inside conkers. The arboriculturalist would be able to give a far more detailed answer. He would be able to explain everything that I've just said, but explain the operation of photosynthesis in the leaves, explain the vessels that transport nutrients from the roots, explain how the bark of the tree is formed. Both of our explanations are accurate, but the arboriculturalist is able to give a far more detailed answer. Christians and Jews worship the same God, but Christians have received a more fuller revelation of the God that we worship. So the Jews will describe a God and we Christians will agree with all that they say. But we will give more detail to that description than a Jew can because we have received the new covenant whereas the Jews are sticking to the old covenant. Any other questions? Questions. Yeah, go on. What's the new Great question. So the question is, what is the new covenant? The new covenant is that agreement that God has made with humanity. The old covenant that is known as the Mosaic covenant was particular and specific to Moses and the people of Israel. But the new covenant is the taking of the promises given to Israel and offered to the whole world, to Jew and Gentile alike, which means that now those of us who are not 
the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob can be grafted onto the vine of Jesse. We can become one with the people of Israel, that we can worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses and David, and that we can also be his priests, that we can offer sacrifice, that we can be his temple, and that he will tabernacle with us in the presence and by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this new covenant is established in the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that now there is no Jew and no Gentile, no black, no white, no Chinese. We are one humanity in Christ, called to worship God here on earth with our whole life, our entire mind, body, soul and strength. That answers your question. Any other questions? Any other questions? On a similar topic, and that the 12 tribes of Israel mentioned in Old Testament, they're also mentioned in Revelation. So they would have been Jewish in the Old Testament. Was there conversion along the way that in Revelation, where the people in that land of 4,000 was that so the question is are the 144,000 mentioned in the book of revelations that come from the tribes of Israel are they Jews yes by ethnicity but they are messianic Jews because it says in scripture in the book of Romans that God has not finished dealing with the Jewish people and he will bring them to his new covenant to be made holy, to be made part of the church. And one of the key differences between Christianity and Islam is that when you become a Christian you don't have to abandon your own culture like you do in Islam. When you look at societies that have had Islam imposed upon them, invariably Arabization also accompanies it. It's happening in Pakistan right now where they're forcing students to learn Arabic. But in Christianity, there's no such thing as Judaization. The Pushtun should be the most noble Christian Pushtun. The Saxon must become the most noblest Christian Saxon. The Ethiopian must be the noblest Ethiopian Christian. And the Arab must be the noblest Arab Christian. We do not believe that one culture is preferable over other cultures like Islam teaches. And this is one of the key differences between Islam and Christianity. Islam equals Arabization. Christianity equals the most noble of yourself that you can be, not the simplistic imitation of a foreign culture, as so many Muslims do, changing their name, taking on Arab customs, copying an Arab man, bowing to an Arab city, praying in Arabic, wearing Arabic fashions. Do you think that the burqa or the niqab is indigenous to India or Pakistan. These are Arab imports. But in Christianity, we say that you take your own clothes and you make them modest. Your own colors, your own fashions, 
your own fabrics. So if you're a pygmy in the rainforest and you make your clothes out of leaves, then you continue to make your clothes out of leaves. You just make yourself modest using those clothes. And that's the difference between Islam and Christianity, is that Christianity teaches the nobility of every culture, whereas Islam teaches every culture is inferior to Arab culture. Any other questions? He spoke first. You should have stayed. You walked off. Are all the religions ultimately following the same God? Sorry? Are all the religions ultimately following the same God? Okay. Guys who heard my answer to the question, are all religions worshipping the same God? How did I answer that question? Get a pair, sound off, speak loud. How, how did I answer that question? No. The, there is a lie in this world that all religions teach worship to the same God. This is a lie pushed by our politicians for political reasons. They push this lie because they are scared of inflaming religious passions that may result in religious conflict. And so as a way of dampening down the possibility of conflict upon the basis of religion. Our political and economic and cultural elites are pushing a false narrative that all religions worship the same God. This is a lie. The Bible teaches in Exodus that even if there were a thousand other gods. We should only worship Yahweh. It says that you shall have no other God before me. By no other name is God known than by the name Yahweh. Therefore, Allah is a false God. Krishna is a false God. All other named gods are false. Odin is a false god. Zeus is a false god. Jupiter is a false god. Those, we Christians, must have an absolute loyalty to Yahweh. And if that means that our loyalty to Yahweh inflames religious tensions, so be it. So be it. Because conflict is preferable to infidelity. Conflict is preferable to compromise. Conflict is preferable to the worship of a false god. So be the nuisance in our society. Be the sandpaper in our society that prevents religious cohesion. And to all of you Christians, who buy into this lie, I challenge you to come here and debate your errors in public. One God. Me. Uh, I am Muslim, you know. I love Torah. Please. I love indeed. Your question, please. I love, uh, one minute. Because I talk, you know. We leave you, you talk, you know. One God, Christian and the Muslim, and Torah and the Indian and the Quran, believe, believe one God. You know what I mean? And I believe because I am I am Christian first, you know. After that Quran is coming, I am I believe Quran because that, that Are you claiming that you converted from Christianity? No 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 brother, brother. I like Christian, I like I like all religion coming from God. Okay, it's let me a, so let me address this point. You know, I love it. Okay, let me address this point. So the point was made So the point was made that a Muslim says that because he believes that the Torah the Injil, he didn't mention the Zabur, but that's in there as well. And the Injil and the Quran all teach the same God. Well, that's an Islamic belief, not a Christian one. We don't believe that the Quran is from God. 
We Christians believe that the Quran was inspired by Satan, inspired by the adversary, inspired by a demon. And so therefore, therefore, the just saying that the Injil, the Torah and the Zabur, which is the Psalms and the Quran, all teach the same God means that it's true. Well, we don't accept that. The Quran was the inspiration of a demon to Muhammad. And it contradicts the Torah. And it contradicts the Zabur. And it contradicts the Injil. And God is not the author of confusion. The father of lies is Satan. He is the one who lies. And therefore, as Christians, we reject the idea that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. Any other question? Any other question going once? Mo 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 Moses, you spoke first. Why did God create hell? God created hell to punish those who insult the honor of God. Any other questions? Going once. Any other questions going once? Any other questions going? Do you think we should have Christians should have fellowship with, with um, people of goodwill who may not be in the same place as us? So as in atheists or pagans or people that you know you work with but you, you get on well with but you don't have the same beliefs. What's your opinion? So should Christians have fellowship with those who are of goodwill? The Bible speaks of those who are of goodwill. Let us be clear. The definition of someone who is of goodwill is someone who supports Christian causes without themselves being a Christian. They're pro-life. They're pro the preaching of the gospel. They're pro the persecuted church, but they are not Christian. Such people should be welcomed amongst us. They should be encouraged to come to church to eat with us, to share our time together. But as well as spending time with them, we should always encourage them to become Christian. Because someone of goodwill is not saved because they have goodwill. You are saved by how you receive or reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And so, we not only need to discern who is of goodwill, i.e. those who support Christian causes, but we must encourage those of goodwill to become Christian. I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to stop. Any other questions? Any other questions? Any question? I'm sorry? Is there a difference between Ethiopian uh, Christianity and what we see in this society? So to the question, are there, is there a difference between Ethiopian Christian doctrine and Latin European Christian doctrine? And the answer is yes, but on nothing that is of essential importance. Ethiopian Christians worship the Divine Trinity. Christians from the North European countries worship the Divine Trinity. Christians from Ethiopia say that Christ is fully God and fully man. Christians in Europe say Christ is fully God and fully man. Christians from Europe use the four Gospels. Christians from Ethiopia use the four Gospels. In fact, we agree on the entire 27 books of the New Testament. Christians in Europe and Christians in Ethiopia celebrate the Eucharist 
and baptism in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So yes, there are differences, but those differences are of secondary importance. And we as Christians must not allow the differences of secondary importance to separate us from being united in the face of the enemies of the church and the enemies of the gospel. Do you think that a jihadi, when he attacks an Ethiopian church, stops to inquire at the door whether they are Roman Catholic, Ethiopian Orthodox or Baptist? Or does he just go in and say that these are Christians and I will kill them for it? He doesn't. The enemies of the gospel are wide, numerous and abroad. Whatever differences we Christians have, we can sort them out in-house later when we have dealt with the imminent threat of the pluralists, the progressives and the Islamists and the ethno-nationalists who hate the church, who hate the name of Christ and who hate the gospel. Thank you very much. Gonna take a break, then I'm gonna come back and start again.